What should be the aim of God's people today? What's our purpose in life? That we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. You know, friends, I can promise you some people are going to hear this. They're going to say, oh, Pastor Doug's being legalistic because I'm talking about specifics. You know, when Jesus introduced people to the, to the Lord and who he was, he then often dealt with specifics. He met the woman at the well. And he said, I'm offering you this living water. And she said, oh, I want that water. He said, okay, you do? Go call your husband. Oh, wait a second. Let's change the subject. He said, that's right. You've had five husbands. And you're living with a guy you're not married to right now. Is Jesus being legalistic? He wanted to save her, but he had to address the sin in her life. Nathan the prophet had to go to David one day and said, thou art the man. I mean, sometimes you've got to be specific. How do you know what to repent of unless preachers are faithfully saying some of the specifics? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Now, you've got the Ten Commandments, but I've itemized some practical ways you could play that out in our modern world. God wants us to avoid worldliness. What will the angels do at Jesus' second coming? He said, if you love me, keep my commandments, for this is the love of God that we should keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. I delight to do your will, O oh my God, yea, your law is within my heart. And the angels will gather together the elect and they'll also take away everything that offends and they're going to be destroyed. I delight to do your will. So if we're doing God's will, is it to be a burden or is it to be a delight? It says his law is in our hearts. Why is the Christian calling? Question 15, such a high calling. Why is a Christian life such a high calling? Answer, it says, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should call forth the praises. Show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God has called us to a life of godliness and holiness. You know, I've, just, I've got a few verses here. I just thought I ought to read to you real quick. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 So that he might establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God and the Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Ephesians 4.24 That you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. 1 Thessalonians 4.7 and 8 For God did not call us to uncleanness but to holiness. Therefore who, he who rejects this does not reject man but God, who's given us his Holy Spirit. And then Hebrews 12, 14, pursue peace, something to be pursued with all people, and pursue what? Pursue holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. So it's something that should be sought after. I remember hearing a story years ago about this, uh, this old bachelor who lived by himself in kind of a frumpy home, and every day he'd walk through town and he'd you know, meet some of his old buddies at the VFW for lunch, and, and then after lunch he'd walk home. And he noticed that one day in the window of an antique store along the way, he saw this beautiful vase, and it just struck him. He thought it was so striking and beautiful and iridescent, and he would stand there and he'd look at it, and he'd move a little bit, and they had lights on it, and he thought, well, that's, that's beautiful. And he wasn't a very cultured man, but he said, I could spot something beautiful, and he'd go home. On the way to lunch again, he'd stop and he'd look at it. This happened for several days. He'd pause, just stare at it. It's a small town. The proprietor knew him. He stepped to the door one day. He said, Fred, why do you just keep looking at it? Why don't you buy it and take it home? You could look at it all day long. He said, how much? He told him. He said, oh, it's high, but I can do it. So he bought it. Bought the vase, brought it home, looked around his, his living room, set it on the mantel above the fireplace. And he sat down in his chair and he looked at it. And he thought, wow, it's this beautiful, but... I had no idea how bad the paint was looking back there. It was all peeling. And so he, uh, he took the vase down and he painted the wall. He put it back up and he thought, well, that looks better. And then he said, wow, the curtains are looking pretty dingy too. Now that I painted the walls, he said, I haven't changed the curtains in 40 years. And they are kind of covered in dust. And so he got a lady neighbor to help him pick out some curtains. He put some new curtains up in his house and sat down in his chair to look at the vase up on the mantel. And springs are popping out of his chair. He said, you know, this is all kind of falling apart around me. I didn't realize it. And, and uh, 
So lo and behold, he said, I probably ought to have this reupholstered. And he had his chair fixed. It was his favorite chair. He wanted to save it. Then he sat the chair down. It was on this old stained carpet. He said, I probably need a new carpet. And he took out the carpet. He put a new carpet in. And then he walked out and he saw the fence falling down. And he said, wow, I had no idea how I was letting all of this just go to pieces. And little by little, his whole house was renovated. And someone said, Fred, what happened? He said, I put a beautiful vase in the middle of the house and it changed everything. You know, when you bring Christ into your heart, the purity of Christ in your heart will little by little stand in condemnation of whatever sin is there. It won't happen all at once. It's like if you've been in the dark for a long time and someone turns on the light, it hurts at first. Don't be discouraged if I cover a subject like this and you go, Pastor Doug, this is heavy. I got a long way to go. That's a good sign. God is calling you to the light. Invite Jesus and his purity into your heart and he will begin sanctifying you. It's a process of a lifetime. You continue to grow closer to the Lord and as you take a step closer to the light, you might discover there's some more stains on your clothes you didn't know about. But you don't stop. Don't turn back to the dark. You keep walking towards Jesus and fix your eyes on Jesus. You will become more and more like him. Is that your desire, friends? I'd like to pray with you and just... Ask right now that you might have that experience and the Lord will show you where you need to begin in your life to make some changes, to kind of redecorate, have a makeover and start looking like and acting like and living like a real Christian, getting the world ready, being his ambassador. Father in heaven, dear Lord, we come to you in Jesus' name and we pray that you will give us the Holy Spirit. Without you, we can do nothing, but we believe the promise through Christ, all things are possible. Lord, you came to set the captive free. And I discussed tonight a lot of areas where people are just in bondage to the world, to the devil. Break those chains. Give them victory. Help them make the practical changes that they need to be real Christians. And I pray you'll bless the church with revival. Help us not be afraid of this subject of holy living and that we will make our minds up to fix our eyes on Christ, laying aside every sin and the weight that does so easily beset us, and to run that race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And we ask all of this in his blessed name. Amen. God bless you, friends. Don't go away. I'm going to come back and try and answer some of your Bible questions in just a moment. To receive today's free offer, simply call our toll-free number, one 877 721 3800 and ask for the free offer displayed on your screen. Or you can email us contact at amazingfactsministries.com. You can also write to us Amazing Facts Ministries, Post Office Box 449, Creston, BC, V0B1G0. Remember to request the free offer number displayed on your screen. May God grant you His eternal peace. Hello friends, we'd like to welcome you all back to Revelation Now. We've come to the portion of the program where we're going to take your Bible questions. We always enjoy this time, Pastor Doug. And of course, we don't know what the questions would be, but we always welcome folks to send in their questions on uh, this topic that we spoke about today, um, the Ambassadors of Christ, Christian Standards, or if you have another Bible-related question, we'd like to take it. Now, unfortunately, Pastor Doug, this is going to be our um, second-to-last uh, question and answer time connected with Revelation Now. Right. But it might be a good time for us to remind our friends that uh, we do this once a week. We have a radio program called Bible Answers Live. and Maybe some of you are watching, you're aware of that. But that's every Sunday evening. We take uh, a whole hour to take people's Bible questions on the air. So it's a radio program. You can also watch on Facebook and people calling with their Bible questions. So if you've never participated in that, we'd encourage you to do that. That's 7 p.m. Uh, Pacific time on a Sunday evening. We take Bible questions. Yep. And it's on, of course, we're on satellite radio, which can be heard across the country, as well as stations all the way from, I think, 300 stations from California to New York. And mm -hmm. Yep. And then on Facebook around the world. Yep, so. of course. All right, well, we have some questions. We'll take the ones that we have up on the screen first. It says, what are some of the greatest dangers for Christians today? Well, I think some of the greatest dangers are, of course, worldliness and uh, the media. Um, 
there, there, there's so much information that is just bombarding the senses, especially the young people, that is teaching morals and values that are very different. And you can just look at what's happened um, in the last, you know, 150 years. Um, the entertainment has sort of made the moral values of the culture continue to go down. And you can look at the, the values of the world used to be, you know, below the church. But as the values of the world have gone down, the church has always just seems to be a little better than the world. Now what's happening is the, the morals and values of the world are actually lower than where of the church are lower than where the world used right. to be. Uh, and I think a lot of that has come to do from uh, Christians having um, just freely watching uh, what the media puts out. Now, there are some good things that you might see on, on television or a DVD, but uh, people are not being as careful through constant bombardment. Folks are just getting used to watching programming that is killing, stealing, lying, committing adultery, and, and it's just, I think it's um, things that used to make us blush don't make us blush anymore. So that, that would be one of the big areas. Okay, very good. Uh, next question that we have, it says, ain't standards cultural? Shouldn't they change with the times? Well, certain things do change with the time. Styles change. I think it was John Wesley that said, uh, we should not be the first to adopt a new style or the last. But not if that style is, you know, violating some biblical principle of morality. And so there are cultural things that are different, you know. As you go to, from place to place, Karen and I travel, and you do too. You know, you go, some countries, we take off our shoes. Well, we went to church in India where... There were 160,000 people coming to church. They all took off their shoes, and they had company hoes for all the shoes. There's nothing wrong with that, so we take off our shoes. There's different things that have changed through history that are not moral issues. And I think a Christian should freely adopt cultural changes so that you can fit in and be a good witness if it doesn't violate a moral principle. Right. That's the big right. issue. Okay, we have another question on the screen. It says, what does it mean to tempt God? The Bible speaks about not tempting God. Well, the devil asked Jesus if he would jump off the pinnacle of the temple. And he said, you know, if, if you really have faith, God will catch you in your, his hands. Jesus said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord. So when we abuse God's protection or we, you know, or we recklessly put God to the test and uh, say, well, if you're really God, you know, I'm going uh, to try and commit suicide and see if you save me. Or... Um, uh, there's a thousand different scenarios I guess a person could make up. You don't want to ever push God to the limit and you know, get into trouble and just ask him to get you out again. Sometimes we tempt the Lord because we say, well, God has forgiven me of this for so many times. I'm going to do it again and just ask him to forgive me. And it's like we're not really repenting. We're playing Russian roulette. So that's another way people tempt the Lord. Okay. All right. Well, we've got some questions that have been sent in. And this one, Pastor Doug, is from the Middle East. And this person is asking, can Muslims get to heaven? Uh, they don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God and that he died on the cross for our sins. But can they still be saved? Well, there are, um, there's that verse there where Peter tells us in Acts chapter 4, there is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. Uh, anybody saved is saved by Jesus. Nobody is saved by, no offense, but nobody is saved by Muhammad or Buddha or Krishna or any other person. The only one who can save is Jesus. Now there may be some people from other cultures and other backgrounds that will be in the kingdom because they lived up to the light they had, they sought after God, and they just they lived at a time of darkness and God winked at it. You get the story of Nahum and the leper. He turned to the true God. He went home to Syria and he said, you know, I, I live in a culture where we're surrounded with idols and and I'm actually, the, the king leans on me when he goes to worship in the house of, what was it, Milcom or whatever, whoever the god was. And uh, Isaiah, or Elisha said, go in peace. So, he, you know, he recognized, uh, I'm going to be surrounded by this culture, but I, I'm believing in the true God now. And so I think for anybody to be saved, you need to really turn to the truth, turn to the light. Christ said, if you did not know, if you have no uh, knowledge then you have no sin. In other words, if a person's totally ignorant, this is why a baby, before the age of accountability, they're innocent. People who maybe grow up in abject darkness to the truth, they follow all the light they have, they're never exposed to the truth. Um, I think that God's going to surprise us and save some of those people. 
And it's interesting, missionaries have gone into foreign countries and sometimes they'll meet a person that seems to have the spirit of God, but they knew nothing about Jesus because they just loved truth. We might find some of those people in heaven, but nobody's saved by virtue of Muhammad. Okay. Somebody else is asking, uh, will God, or when will God seal his people? Well, you know, he, first of all, everybody needs to be sealed with the Holy Spirit. But there's a special sealing of God and marking of the beast that happens in the last days when these issues of uh, who we obey are really going to be brought to the forefront. And it's going to be made a, an issue of, you know, which side are you on? Are you going to bow to the image of the beast or are you going to stand up for God? There's a special sealing that comes to God's people. Now, God's people can receive the seal now. Uh, you know, we can get the seal of the Holy Spirit now. And, and uh, keeping the Sabbath is sort of an example that we worship the God of the Bible. It's right there in the middle of his law. It's it got the word holy. Um, but uh, everyone needs the seal of the Holy Spirit. You can get that now. Okay. But the mark of the beast hasn't happened yet. All right, somebody's asking, Mark chapter 14 uh, and verse 51 to 52, it speaks about a young man who fled away at the time of Christ's crucifixion. Apparently, they laid hold of him and he left his garment in the yes. hand of the man and he fled away. Do you know who this, do we know who this person is? You know, the Bible scholars are fairly certain it is Mark. Now, young John Mark, one who Peter dictated, probably the Gospel of Mark is largely the Gospel of Peter. None of the other Gospels mention this young man who was probably lingering outside of the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was arrested. He wanted to be close uh, he knew where the apostles went. He may have been related to Peter in some way. And when Christ was arrested, he followed from a distance. He just had his bedclothes wrapped around him. And he wanted to see what was happening. The guards tried to grab him, and he shook free and ran naked, kind of like Joseph with uh, his robe and Potiphar's wife. They think it was John Mark, because he would be the one who would have intimate knowledge of that. Right. Okay, well, we have another question. This is from a 13-year-old. And uh, I'm assuming it's a boy. He says, along with being very strong, was Samson a giant? You know, the amazing thing about Samson is when his hair was cut off, it says, uh, he even told Delilah, he says, if I, when he finally divulged the truth, he said, you know, I've been a Nazarite from my youth. And if I were to be shorn of my seven locks, he said, I'll be as weak as other men. So it wasn't, I'm sure he was a fine physical specimen, but it wasn't that that gave him his strength. It was the Spirit of God. It says, when the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he killed the Philistines, he killed the lion. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, he pushed down Dagon's temple. And so it was really the Spirit of the Lord. I don't think Samson was uh, you know, 20 feet tall or anything. Yeah. Okay. Here's another question. This is kind of a deep one. It says, is it possible to forgive and forget deep offenses that someone has done to you? Well, don't forget the promise in the Bible, all things are possible with God. But God does not require us to forget everything in order to forgive a person. You know, um, I think if someone's deeply hurt you, God has created people with minds where we are trained when we experience pain, that helps us remember. And if you've had a really painful experience, it's hard to forget that. You can choose to forgive the person and that means you choose not to dwell on it or always remind them that you've forgiven them. We all know people that forgive us and they keep reminding us they forgave us. Um, but um, you can choose not to think about it. And I've repeated this many times. You can't prevent the birds from flying over your head, but you can prevent them from making a nest in your hair. So if, if you're reminded, you know, I've had this happen to me. Some people really offended me and I forgave them. And then it would come back what they did. And I'd have to tell myself, you forgave them. Lord, take that away. I don't want to dwell on it. And I found that every time I said that, it became less and less, so I don't think about it anymore. But you got to work on it. And yeah, he can deliver you from those memories. Okay. All right, another question. Did John the Baptist know that Jesus, his cousin, was the Messiah? I don't think John recognized it. I think the real epiphany for John came when Jesus walked. Because uh, the Lord said, and, and you might have to help me remember this verse. I think it's in the Gospel of John that the Lord spoke to John and said, on whomever you see the Holy Spirit fall, he is the one. And John saw Jesus, and he saw the Holy Spirit come upon him. He said, that's the one. The Holy Spirit revealed to John, this is the Messiah, the Christ. And so up until that point, I don't think that John knew until it was supernaturally revealed to him there at the Jordan River. 
The verse you're referring to is First John chapter one verse thirty-three. Is it First it says, John or John? Uh, sorry, just John one John, thirty-three. Yeah. It says, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descend and remain upon him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So, that's a good verse there. All right, another question that we have. What kind of song had sung or was sung um, the Lord Jesus with his disciples in Matthew 26, verse 30? And I think it's referring to the upper room. Yes. Where it says they sang a song and then they, they left and went to the Mount of Olives. You know, we could guess uh, there are several of the psalms that were what they called the Paschal Psalms or their songs for the Passover. And there, I don't know which one they sang, so it would be just speculation. I don't have the list in front of me, but I think 60, Psalm 69 may have been one of the Passover psalms. They could have sung it. They could have sung Psalm 22 was a Passover psalm, which is what Jesus quoted from the cross. Mm -hmm. So, it, you know, we'll have to ask him when we get to heaven. It could have been one of several. Okay. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing Jesus sing. I think he probably had a nice voice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, somebody's asking, why isn't the tribe of Ephraim included in the list given of the 144,000? I'm glad they asked. Someone caught that, that in, um, in the 144,000, two tribes are left out. Ephraim, Ephraim sort of, you know, is included in the fact that Joseph is mentioned. But Ephraim, it says in, uh, is it Hosea? Where it says Ephraim is joined to his idols, leave him alone. The, the nation of Ephraim had sort of turned to idolatry and it sounded like God finally said, look, you've rejected me, I'm turning away. And in the, the prophecies that Jacob gave regarding Dan, he said, Dan is like a viper. And so these two tribes, because of what their names meant in those prophecies, they were removed and instead you have Levi included and you have Joseph included. The word Joseph means adding or added. And it is interesting, I think you mentioned a little earlier, that the, the, the order in which the names are listed in Revelation chapter 7 is unique. It is. You know, it yeah. doesn't begin with the oldest. Usually it begins with the oldest. It of the starts 12 out with sons. Reuben, ends with Benjamin, but right. not this list. Yeah. yeah, so it's a little different. Okay, another question that we have. Um, Romans chapter 13, verse 1 and 2, talks about authorities being appointed by God, and they're just asking for an explanation of that. How do we apply that today? Romans 13, verse 1 and 2. Well, yeah, I think that uh, people often get the leadership they deserve. <laughs> and, but God, he does appoint certain authorities. And when he says appointing authorities here, I don't think God is speaking about a specific individual. I think he means that God has arranged that in society there's going to be authority that must be respected, whether it is a mayor, governor, police, president, sheriff, you know, and we should abide by the rules most societies have, you know, most of the laws are based on good reason and uh, we should respect those. You know, most of the cultures in the world, their laws are based on the Ten Commandments. I don't know anywhere it's legal to murder right. or steal or lie. And so uh, we should obey the laws of the land. And I know it's hard sometimes for us to obey that speed limit. <laughs> hey, Pastor Ross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm guilty. I'm yeah, guilty you're mentioning me, huh? Yeah. I got pulled over this week. Karen was with me. I asked for mercy, and they gave us mercy. Praise the Lord. All I right. was in a hurry to do God's business. That hasn't happened to me for a long time, Pastor Doug. It's just you've got lucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Revelation chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, who are the ones that mourn? And uh, Revelation 1, 7 says, Behold, he comes with clouds, every eye shall see him. Those also that pierced him, and the nations shall mourn. Who are the ones that mourn? Yeah, and I think it's also in Matthew, uh, is it 25? Then all the tribes of the earth will see him coming, and they will mourn. Um, it's speaking of those that are lost because the majority of the world, see, Christians are part of the tribe of God. The 144,000 is also symbolic of God's tribe. All the other tribes are the lost. And uh, those that are not caught up to meet the Lord in the air when he comes are the tribes of the earth. They will all mourn his coming because they're going to, what's it say? They're going to, call for the rocks and the mountains to fall well, on them and hide, hide them from the mm -hmm. face of him that sits on the throne. So much of the world, the Lord's coming is not a good day. For the saved, it is a blessed hope. For the lost, it says it is a day of darkness. And um, it's called the day of the Lord. And it's, it's going to be an awesome time of judgment for most of the world. Okay. All right, here's an interesting question. It says, before Christ, the nation of Israel was chosen and blessed by God. Do you think that there is any parallel with the U.S.? 
Well, I have no question that God chose the United States to be a place that would be fertile ground for Christianity, Protestantism to explode. Because right after the beast received its deadly wound, God provided a nation that would be largely comprised of immigrants who came, many of them fleeing religious persecution. And it took a few uh, generations for us to get our footing about religious freedom, but with Roger Williams and uh, the influence he had on the early government, by the time they got to the Constitution, we recognized the importance of having a government where people had freedom to worship and they also had freedom of, uh, to select their leaders. And in that environment, uh, Christianity exploded from coast to coast in North America. And not everyone was a Christian, but it became a really great environment for uh, Christianity to flourish. And there were several great enlightenments in America with everyone from George Whitfield and John Wesley to Jonathan Edwards and to Charles Finney. There were several great revivals that spread across Billy Sunday, even the revivals of Billy Graham. There have been times of great revival. And um, so God has, I think, exploited the freedom here for that purpose. And also great missionary activity. A yeah. lot of printing of Bibles and Christian literature and even the use of media today, a lot of it is coming from North America in the proclamation of the gospel. And I'll mention something with that. Uh, the American ideal of freedom started here and it spread. You know, Karen and I have been to North and South Korea. We get to step over the border in North Korea. Two completely different worlds. One is so sad and so dark and so poor. And South Korea, where America fought for the freedom, then gave them their freedom. Christianity's exploded in the country great prosperity, great blessing. They're sending missionaries around the world. So those ideals, as they spread to other countries of freedom of religion, it, it uh, really helped the mission of around the, go around the world. Okay. Somebody's asking, how did Moses change God's mind if God knows everything? And I think they're referring to where Moses says, Lord, blot them out of your book or blot my name out of your book. Well, save that's your people. a figure of speech. I mean, God knows everything. You never surprise the Lord. And when you confess your sins, you don't say, Lord, sit down. I'm going to really, I got something shocking to tell you. He knows everything. When it says he changed his mind through Moses' prayer and intercession, God was pleased that Moses was praying. It was the spirit of God in Moses that made Moses plead with the Lord to show mercy to Israel. God wanted that. But he said, okay, okay, uh, I've relented. I'll change my mind. So um, I think God is always anxious for us to plead with him for mercy. And I think we also see that illustrating the situation with the angels that went to Sodom, yeah. where Abraham sort of interceded for Lot. God didn't have to tell Abraham that he's going to destroy the city. It's as if God was almost looking for someone to intercede. To intercede exactly. So a type of Christ. Good point. In that Good sense. point.